you know, it feels like you have multiple fractures in both legs and you have a 50 pound weight on top of them. And that's how it feels resting, with nothing touching them at all. That's how it feels. And so, of course, preserving your energy and walking and things like that, it increases the pain level as well. So, um, I did a bunch of treatments and finally one of my doctors, um, they, they did this new treatment and um, it was something that was a trial treatment. Nothing else was going to supposed to help. I was told that I would never walk again. I was told that I was going to die in the next couple months and that it would be because of my condition because it continued to spread and eventually it would get into my vital organs and cause them to shut down and there was nothing that we could do to stop it. So we did this trial experiment at UCLA Medical Hospital and um, it was very successful for the time being and allowed me to walk again and I um, was able to come here to Tony And my freshman year here, I, it was just like anybody else's freshman year. I had a great time, went to Costco and all that. And um, I went into this remission which really, they've never ever heard of anyone going into remission before, but because of the procedure, they, um, the doctor hit something, did something wrong, and <coughs> caused me to, it damaged my nerves, and caused me to go into this remission. Anyways, so came to Stony Brook, and um, after a couple months, I came out of remission, and once again, the pain was there in both legs, both, the full length of both legs. I started going to the hospital here and went underwent a bunch of other trial um, treatments, including being put into a medical induced coma every week for uh, two and a half weeks. So all of my the end of my sophomore year, my whole junior year, my whole and most of my senior year, I was going and being put into a coma for um, every week for about four hours. While working classes and working and all of that. <laughs> Which was, it was difficult, it was. Anyways, <laughs> finally it stopped working. And um, so my doctor said, you know, we can't keep doing this. If you're not getting any benefits out of it, you gotta, you gotta go forward with it. And I think that you should go to the MIP, which is this fabulous, the best hospital in the world, or in the nation at least. And so the summer of 2011, I attended the MIP where it completely changed my life. Um, and before I actually went though, I thought I was going to be um, in the hospital for at least a couple weeks, and I thought I don't want to be in one of those like, terrible gowns where your butt shows, you know? Um, so I thought, you know, I would get a, a onesie, just a regular old onesie, just to keep myself warm because hospitals are cold. So I started researching it online, and I found this company that does different animal onesies. And so there's cows and pigs and dogs and you name it, they have it. And finally, I came across this one that was a dinosaur. And I thought it was so cool because it's something that was different that you wouldn't ordinarily see as you walk across, you know, the world. Like you can see pigs, you can see dogs, you can see these other things. But a dinosaur, how cool! Something that is so unique that you just can't see anymore. So I got the dinosaur also because my brother, he, growing up, he loved dinosaurs and it made me kind of think of him too, so gotta give him a little bit of credit as well. So I got the dinosaur onesie. And, um, and so I thought, you know, also this onesie could do a lot more than just keep me warm. It could do a lot more than just keep me happy. It could also make other people happy. I mean, you can't. You can't like see someone walking down the hall in a dino onesie and like not completely smile or laugh or be shocked. So, uh, so I started when I went to the mail tonight. I started wearing it in the hospital, just like nothing was different. And people's reactions were so great to see someone that you turn the corner to just all of a sudden just start smiling because they see you was is like the best feeling in the entire world. And one story in particular that I remember, um, it was actually the first day that I wore my onesie in the hospital, was I was going around to go get lunch. And on my way to the cafeteria, there were these two little girls that were in wheelchairs. And they were put to IVs, 
they were in you know, the um, regular gowns and everything, and I'm also pushing them. And as soon as I turned around the corner and they saw me, they got the biggest smile on their face. Like, I can't even tell you how big they were, it's from ear to ear. And then I went over to them and I said hi, and they were like, oh, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I was walking around, I'm going to get lunch. And um, the kids, they, both the girls smiled and they were like, can we get hugs? And so of course I hugged them. And um, so then I started to walk away and one of the moms pulled me aside and she said, what you're doing is amazing. And you don't even know what you're doing. You're, you're just saying this is something that's fun. And you, these girls have not smiled in like months. You can't remember when you've seen a smile like that on their faces before. And you were able to bring that to them and in such a desperate need at the time that they needed that. That's my life ultimate. And from then on, I was like, this is something that can really be a lot more than just a doctor. It can be a lot more than just me being in a hospital and being sick or whatever you want to call it. And the, it was such a simple action. It was such a simple way of getting um, someone to get a smile on their face. So, uh, after my, I spent over a month at the Mayo Clinic and was able to return here to Stony Brook. And this was this past year. And while I was here, um, of course, you guys all know, during midterms and finals, Stonebrook gets a little, a little bit stressful, stressful and pretty anxious, and the, like it's just tense. And so I thought, you know, in the back of the lecture hall, and walked in, and the professor saw me, and he just, he started busting up. And I knew already that success. <laughs> My day was going to be great. And of course, I had to walk all the way to the very front row of the lecture hall and sit in the very front to make sure everyone could see me. Just not that I wanted them the attention, but just because I knew that it would bring a smile to people's faces during a time where if you're stressed out, you're anxious, you're freaking out, you're running through all of those last minute notes, trying to remember the last bit of information that you can retain. And it was, it was magic. I walked in and there was this cloud of tension. And as soon as I got to the front of the room, the cloud had lifted. It was like the entire mood of the room changed just because of what I was wearing getting to the front. And so then I knew that, that this was something that could apply beyond just the hospital. So on the reactions, I also wanted to go get food, dining halls, and all that. And people just started smiling. You know, of course, you get some of the kids like, what the heck is she doing? You know, weirdo walking around in this dinosaur outfit. But later on, I would hear other people say, oh, did you see? There was a girl, she was walking around in a dinosaur lens. And like, it was so cool. Like, I wish I had one. And, and it just kind of perpetuated it without even other people seeing me. So, um, so it's really cool. And actually, the picture here, I just want to point out really quick, is there's a university, I think it's through CAPS, brings um, animals on campus to help like, reduce stress um, for people. And so this is uh, some of the dogs that they bring on campus. So kind of tag team is with the stress reducer. And yeah, that's awesome. Um, so then, there's, I started making things known here. Um, I'm a studio art major, and for one of my sculpture classes, we were given the assignment to make a precious object. This was supposed to be something that if you were stranded on a desert island, and you could only have one thing, bring one thing with you, what would you bring? You know, a bunch of people said knives, iPods, um, books, um, fire starters or something, pregnancies, you know, survival kit. And I sat there and I was trying to figure out what would I bring. And what I came up with was I would want to be able to bring um, a way of looking at things and being able to find the positive in whatever you're experiencing. So whether you're standing in the middle of an island or in the middle of the ocean on an island, to be able to not be depressed about what's going on. I mean, it's terrible situation. I would want to be able to break that idea and be able to adapt to whatever was going on and be like, you know what? All right, this is a terrible situation, yes, but I'm going to get through it. 
I'm not just going to let this, you know, ruin my entire life, although it's kind of a really big ultimate thing, but I'm going to try to make the best of it. You got to do what you got to do. And so the way that I was able to manifest that visually was through the masculine that I was able to do that when I was in the hospital. And so this is, I've created this, um, it's a bronze figure out of, um, that is me and my bathroom, which is right there, which you can check out. Great. So that's where the imagery of the bathroom really started to uh, be created outside of me just in the world. So then I started thinking, all right, this is good. I really like this idea. I can make this into something a lot bigger than just me, that people don't have to interact with just to see me. I can do this when I'm not there as well. So I was like, how can I share this idea with others? How can I share this with people I don't even know? And I had this idea that someone with such a great way of looking at life that I've seen actually change my own personal life. How can I share this with other people? So I started, I came up with unsuspected patterns. Um, and so I created a hundred number of wax figurines and I hid them on my um, And so on one there was also a tag that said, uh, take me on an adventure, post pictures of me at advancedonlazyproduct.com. And the reason why I wanted to include the, the website was it was a way that people could interact with each other. They could bring people together and it was a way that um, you could personalize your own as well. So me creating the dinosaurs was only half the other. Um, and putting it out there and putting my love and my caring and the ideas about the project out there. The second part of the project was, or the second half of it, of the artwork, was people interacting back with the dinosaur figurines. So through um, Tumblr, which uh, people were able to submit their own pictures to, then um, you could see it and you could follow them along with, that's these pictures over here. Um, you could follow them figure it out. So it says number three, number five, whatever, someone can still get it. And then later on, you can see number five, and someone will understand. Um, and it was a way that showed that you mattered in what your dinosaur figurine was your personal gift to you that you could like have and it was what your love and my love and care for you. Um, and especially for our generation, we're all obsessed with connecting with each other digitally. We have Facebook, you know, all these different forums. And Tumblr was another way to do so with engaging with the figurines. So people started getting mad, like really mad. They wanted to find these figurines, and I only made a hundred of them. So how could I include everyone that wanted to be included into this project without just giving them a wax figurine? And so I came up with silk screening shirts. Now it would be really expensive if I printed all these shirts and just you know, handed them out for free. So my way to fix that was to have other people bring me their own shirts and I would slip screen the image on it for free. And this way it would also um, have a face-to-face -face interaction. So the Tumblr website was just building a foundation for a community digitally. And now with the space with the silk screening, it was incorporating a face-to-face -face person personal interaction between me and the participants in the project. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the imagery. So the obviously the um, dinosaur onesie that's in the middle is the like icon of the project. Um, and then there's text that says, I was extinct once before, we will not be the dinosaur. This has a very personal meaning to me. Um, when I was in a wheelchair and wasn't able to really do anything, I was in bed all the time. I wasn't able to go to school. I wasn't able to hang out with friends. I wasn't really able to do anything. And I was alive, but I wasn't alive. This is how I see it. And so I, that's me considering myself extinct. It's also a playoff of the whole dinosaur, you know. Um, and 
so you will not be the death of me. Um, I was there before, and now I have found a way to have a positive attitude about what's going on and put a positive twist on what I'm going through. And I'm not going to let myself get back to where I was. I'm not going to let myself get back into a bed and not be able to live my life again. And so what I want people, other people to take from this text is the fact that no matter what's going on in your life, what challenges you face, whatever you're going through, big, small, you're still your coffee, whatever, don't let that ruin your day. Don't let that ruin your life. If it, I mean, obviously it happens in your life, but <laughs> if something else happens, don't let it just overpower your mind and ruin what's going on because you can put a twist on it. You can be positive. You can make a difference. So that's where the text comes from, is as a reminder. So when you see other people wearing their shirts around campus or around, you see pictures, whatever, it's a reminder of that. Um, so the effects of the project thus far was on, um, it's just building a community. That was a really big, that is the big part of it. And it's something, though, that's so much more than just what's visual. It's more than just the wax figurines and the t-shirts. It's the ideas and the conceptual aspect of it that is creating a change within people. And it's the idea of you know being able to have a positive, positive perspective and adapt to challenges that we face in our lives. Um, it also has started to create a social synergy. So people are coming together through seeing other people that have shirts, I've had other friends go up to other people and be like, oh, cool shirt. Sure. Like, yeah, the Max Realty Project's awesome. Could you, like, have you checked it out? Have you gotten a wax figurine? And they talk about it. So it's creating a bond, even though people don't even know about what They don't know each other. Um, it also uses social media as a public forum. So Tumblr, the Facebook as well, um, it's bringing people together from across the world now. Um, the wax figurines have gone around the world to Berlin, to Chile, to Israel, to Vietnam, and it, this using digital forums allows people to connect across the world. Um, also, the dinosaur onesie has become kind of like street art. It is, if you think about it, it's kind of like a contemporary way of um, like tagging, like repeating. Except I'm not doing it a legally, and B, it's a, it has so much more of a deeper meaning. It has a, an icon or a signature that's the dinosaur figure, um, but it also has a meaning behind it. It has a legacy that something that's left behind that has meaning and purpose behind what's going on. So um, it's becoming a part of contemporary artwork as well, um, and it's a self-portrait. Um, and it gives people um, a part of the project right away. So, um, I had the pleasure this summer of taking this project on the road. I was just, all this has happened um, within this past spring semester. So, it happened in the past six months. Um, so, this summer, I decided that I wanted to expand the project. And so I took it on the road. I did a month and a half road trip up and down the coast of California. Pretty much as an experimental road trip. Um, I didn't really know how the world was going to react. I mean, on the Stanford campus, it's a small, smaller community of people. And I definitely have support from the art department and other departments on campus to help push the project forward. But in the real world, in California, there's it's going to visit a bunch of other communities. It's me being the outside person coming into their own places. And I wasn't sure how people were going to react to it. And it was it was scary, <laughs> to do that for sure. But I definitely met a lot of amazing people that welcomed me with open arms and was able to talk to a lot of people and make a lot of um, connections with people that are still, in, all these people are still involved in the project today. And um, it was it was very interesting. Along my trip, I also, um, I met this one lady, 
and she was amazing. And as soon as I told her about the project, she came over to me and she told me that um, she had a wig on and she, you know, groomed her wig and she said that um, your pro I'm so insecure about this, that, that your project gives me hope. Your project is what has gotten me through what I've been going through, through chemo, through um, she had breast cancer. And she just said, you have to look at life in a positive way. You have to keep the person forward. Because if you don't, you, you stop living. And it's, there's, there's no point. And she said, she told me this story about how she used a similar ideal to get her through what she was going through. She had been going through chemo and radiation, and um, her hair was starting to fall out. And she said one day she just finally was able to just let go of all of her insecurities, and she told her husband, she said, go grab, um, grab the camera and just hit record. And she uh, they went into the backyard, and it was really windy outside. And she just bent over and she told her husband, she said, don't, just keep, keep recording, don't stop, no matter what happens. And, you know, my husband, what is she about to do? And she bent over and she leaned back, and as she leaned back, she ran her hands through her hair, and all of her hair just went into the wind, and it was just such a releasing moment for her. And she said that she started laughing hysterically because she thought she was a human dandelion. That it just it was all going in the wind, and I thought that was that's so beautiful that somebody was able to take something that is so so like in, like so vulnerable to have that moment and to be able to just let go of that. And I said I told her I, I gave her a hug, of course, and was like you're amazing. And but that's that's the part of the project was. To be able, to, she understood. She completely understood the entire project as soon as I told her, because she was able to put a little spin on what she was going through and push through what what she was, what challenges she had in her life. Um, and so I did a little research, and it turns out that there is something that um, psychologists and researchers have been <coughs> looking into is something called post-traumatic growth. Now, I'm pretty sure we've all heard of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, pretty much you go through something and afterwards you are like, um, you have like, flashbacks and things like that. But doctors and researchers are starting to find that there's something called post-traumatic growth, which means that after someone has gone through something that's traumatic, whether that, you know, traumatic can be in large scale, small scale, um, different things, but Afterwards, people are coming out of their situation appreciating life more, appreciating the little things in life, um, and being able to be inspiration for other people and to push forward through whatever they're going through. So um, that was something that I was kind of like, huh, I've never heard of that before. And um, and that's you know the project for me. So all right, so. Coming to the end of the lecture, the artist talk here, um, I just want to share with you guys the lessons that I've learned thus far. And these are the three, if you break down the entire project, what have I learned personally through the project? And they're these three things. A positive perspective can help you adapt to challenges in your life. Others can inspire us and that we can inspire others. Um, and I'm going to run through each of those really quick. For a positive attitude, um, I learned that you know I still have bad days. I am still um, the Mayo Clinic didn't cure anything. Um, pretty much what they've done is they've helped me um, be able to look at my life differently. They've helped me adapt to my challenges to the different things that I have, and um, to be able to stay positive about things. And and so even though I have bad days. I am, and I'm worse than I was before. Uh, it's, my disease has spread to the whole length of both legs, to my right arm, and across the top of my shoulders, and now it's starting to go down my left arm. Um, even though it progressed and it's worse than it was when I was in the wheelchair, I'm not in a wheelchair. I'm not on any medications, and I'm still here, able to go to school with all of you guys, and look normal, hopefully, except when I was in my onesie, which then I just look awesome. <laughs> but, um, and it's, even though, my point is, is that even though I still have bad days, that you can't let that get you down. I can't let just one bad day 
make me throw up my hands and say, all right, I'm going to give up on college. I'm going to give up on all these people that are here supporting this project. I, I can't do that. And so I just, yeah. And um, also, all of these different people have um, also started supporting the project and have kept me pushing forward as well. Um, also, it's a way of, um, when things were really bad and I was in a wheelchair, um, I was concerned about, my biggest concern wasn't about dying. It wasn't about how bad the pain would get. It was always about how people aren't going to remember me. People are not going to have made a difference in this world. And to be able to leave a legacy of where somebody, after you've gone, you've left, whether that's the room, whether that's this you know, world or whatever, that people can still be affected and inspired by what you do. And so this project also plays into that for me. Um, second, others can inspire us. Um, all of you guys that are sitting here right now today are helping support this project. Um, everyone who has submitted pictures to the Tumblr page has pushed this project forward. There are many days where I'm, I've gone to my friends and I mean, I've said, all right, is what I'm doing making a difference? Does it matter? Because if not, you know, I'm putting a lot of energy into this. Is, is this worth it? And I just, whenever I look at the Tumblr, they're like, go look at the Tumblr page. Or they'll say, you know, think of all the people that you've, you've changed. Think of all the people that you've inspired. And instantly, within like two seconds, I'm like, all right, back on page, let's go. What can we do more? How can we push this project further? So all of you guys are inspiring me every day, OK? And, um, and third, that we can inspire ours. I never thought that in my entire life, I never thought that I would be able to be standing up here before you guys today and be talking and having people come up to me and say, Wow, you're so inspirational. Like, I can't believe that you're doing this. I can't believe, like, you should go and you should give inspirational talks and, like, all this stuff. And I just sit there and I'm like, me? Me, the, the little girl that in kindergarten who, you know, had my head down and my hands underneath me, not wanting attention, but I could do that. And I think for, I never knew I could do that. And so I think that this kind of goes back to, I felt my grandfather's philosophy that, um, that I was able to inspire other people because I thought that it would help it make you guys proud, it would make other people proud, and it would help other people. And in turn, I was able to achieve my own goals and grow as a person as well. And so now I'm asking you guys to believe in yourselves and know that you guys can inspire people as well. Just because I'm standing up here with a microphone telling you my story about you know all of my medical challenges, um, we all have our own story, whether that's not whether that's you know something else, um, and that you guys have the power to inspire other people as well, and I think that we all forget that too often, and um, and so I hope that the Dinosaur Lindsay project to you guys can be something that maybe you guys can help inspire other people, and hopefully for the Dinosaur Lindsay project, and eventually that in turn can turn into inspiring people for yourselves. So. Um, and lastly, this is one of my favorite quotes. <coughs> the question is not whether you will meet adversity, but how are you are going to meet it. So, um, thanks you guys for coming out and supporting the project. And